Nola, Nola was a disaster, we all admit it. We all realize it. But I'd just like to say two things about it. One was the people who were concerned with Nola were the same people who were concerned with what was another rather remarkable feat of recovery, which was getting over 70,000 Mamma deities out of the camps, back into ordinary life, without any disturbance to law and order. But basically what we must remember is that people died, many people died, as a result of the violence administered. Testicles were screwed off, people were punched silly, they were given cold water treatment, they were given electric shock treatment. Practically anything that you or I could think of was in fact probably in use in Kenya in one or other camp. No senior official was dismissed over Hola. Some months later, Bering himself retired as planned. After Hola, the British released the remaining detainees. They simply went home. Although the emergency came to an end officially in 1960, the most militant underground leaders were still kept in prison or restriction. Loyalists and moderates, on the other hand, were being recruited into the civil service as the British government pursued a new policy in Kenya, the creation of a stable and cooperative African government on which to confer independence. Can you imagine in Kenya, a place mm. you've lived in for a long time, mm. Mm. the day when Africans will govern the country and you will be governed by them? Well, I haven't really given an awful lot of thought. Do you think it's possible? Uh, oh, yes, I think so, to a later date. How would you react to that? Well, I think we're, um, we've all got to realize that one of these days we've, we've got to accept it. Bering hoped that land reform and money for farmers would win over the remainder. While the chiefs accepted medals, the masses still looked to Kenyatta as their leader. We were telling them that Kenyatta would never, ever return to the Kikuyu country. Never, ever. And we were making this promise to the loyalists, we were making it to the general public. This was, of course, uh, supplemented by the fact that Kenyatta's name, his house was totally removed, his name was removed from everything. He, he was now to be a non-person. In the beginning of things, when mankind started to populate the earth, the man Gikuyu, the founder of the tribe, was called by the Mogai, the divider of the universe, and was given as his share the land with the ravines, the rivers, the forests, the game and all the gifts that the Lord of Nature bestowed on mankind. At the same time, Mogai made a big mountain, which he called Kerinyaga, as his resting place went on inspection tour and as a sign of his wonders. It is probable that Kerinyaga, or Mount Kenya, wasn't seen by a white man until the middle of the 19th century. This part of the world was one of the last to be discovered by Europe. Even the slave trade had left it fairly undisturbed. On the sweeping highland plains, Great nomadic tribes lived with their herds. In the fertile hills, the planters reclaimed the land. Different peoples lived side by side, now in contact, now in isolation, now in conflict, now in cooperation. Jomo Kenyatta was born into this world at the very moment it began to crumble. Will you press for the release of Jomo Kenyatta? Certainly, yes. How? Again, by intensifying our efforts and more pressure on the British government and also the Kenya government and using whatever influences we have gained from this present constitution for um, further efforts to secure his release. Ironically, the man on whom the British government and later the settlers came to rely most heavily for the success of this policy was the man they'd imprisoned in 1953 as the leader of Mao Mao, Jomo Kenyatta. Do you now consider that your relief would be a threat to Kenya security? I do not think so. Quite definitely not. Definitely, I do not think so. And what about the loyalists who are afraid of your... They have relief? nothing to fear. You will discourage any... I have been discouraging any um, revenge or any hatred 
and my aim is to have all the people uh, united. Excellent. What do you think of Kenya's prospects now that you have an elected government or mainly composed of Africans? Well, I do not think, I do not take it that way, uh, that is composed of uh, African, because I think uh, it's only, uh, uh, there are many black faces without uh, power. At present, uh, I mean, under uh, uh, Lancaster House Constitution, there are many African or black faces in the council with less power. The all power is less uh, with the governor, I think, because he has the veto. He can veto anything that is passed by the council. Do you yourself consider yourself more inclined towards the National Union or the Democratic Union? I am for all Africa. I am not, um, I, I do not belong to Kanu or Kadu. I belong to them all. Are you now, at this time, prepared to condemn outright all excesses, so far as the Mau Mau were concerned, in the past? Well, not only Mau Mau, but I think all violence. I am non-violent myself. You disagree with what they did during that time? Well, I mean to say, I said, I, I, I still stick to my, to my um, uh, words, which I said in Kapenguria, and also what I repeated again in uh, Macharia, Macharia's case, uh, Ekitale. A great many Africans who were loyal to the government during the emergency are fearful of what would happen to them if you were released. Are there any grounds for those fears? There's no ground at all. Neither those who were in the forest nor those who were royal or home guard have anything to fear at all because I think uh, all of them are brothers and sisters. The cabinet decided Britain could no longer sustain white settler power in Kenya. Instead, the new colonial secretary, Ian MacLeod, announced Britain must come to terms with the growing force of African nationalism. Ricard was not a man who minced words. He told everybody that the European position was really going to be dismantled. The sense of shock on the part of the local Europeans was immense, and I think the sense of shock to the colonial administration was equally great. We were really quite taken aback by the swiftness of uh, determined change. Was MacLeod ready to listen to reasoned opposition to the speed at which he wanted to go? No. He hardly listened to anybody. In January 1960, he called all Kenya's leading politicians to a meeting in London. MacLeod and I were discussing the general position of decolonization, really, you know, and how the timing should go when all of a sudden a man brought in a message, in other words, a telegram. And MacLeod opened this telegram and read it and gave a great start. And he turned and said, my God, Michael, look at that, look at that. We're going to be the last in Africa instead of the first. And I read the telegram and it was a message from a representative in Brussels to say that uh, the Belgians had decided immediately to give the Congo independence. Now, that was a tremendous shock to me, because I suddenly realized that MacLeod wasn't at all interested in my fate or Kenya's fate. He was only really interested in whether the British are going to be the first or last in discarding the robes of colonialism. MacLeod decided to give power to the Africans faster than any of them expected. Do you believe that one day Kenya will be governed by Africans? I believe that one day Kenya will be governed by a democratic government representative and elected by the people and by the people i include anybody who decides to make kenya his home in how many years who accepts to be treated as um, an equal citizen with everybody else throughout the conference my party and i never uh, uh, my party and i never de de deviated uh, from these objectives and our primary concern at every moment has been the future welfare of our country, economic, political, as well as social welfare. Uh, it is because I believe 
uh, this so strongly that after every, uh, after very careful consideration, I have agreed to the formation of a coalition. We have certainly not solved the problems of Kenya, but I believe we can claim that this conference, by reaching this agreement, has made it possible to find a solution to the problems of Kenya. But what we have to do is to see how many of these problems which are constitutional we can solve in our discussions here. And the more successful we are in that task, the closer we shall be to a state where the people of Kenya have full control over their own destiny. After four weeks of argument, McLeod decided it was time to call a halt. He allowed everybody to talk and talk and talk themselves out. I saw very interesting <laughs> discussion because when he knew that we had all talked ourselves off, then he actually came with his proposals. McLeod announced, to general surprise, an immediate African majority in the Kenyan parliament. But before independence could be granted, two dangers remained. Kenyatta, the British believed, could bring chaos to Kenya. But popular African support for him was so strong that most African politicians now felt obliged to demand his release. We, we do understand and realize the fears of the European minorities in Kenya. They regard or link Jomo Kenyatta with uh, Mau Mau or terrorism. But we, the African people, know that he is a sincere leader of his people who had devoted all his time to the benefit of the, uh, 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 of the ordinary man. The other danger was the die-hard whites. They had always relied on support within the Tory party. They felt betrayed by the prime minister. Macmillan feared their hostility would topple him. We were naturally very upset. I mean, when you lived in a country like Kenya, you fought for it, and you rooted uh, deep in the soil of Kenya because it was our heritage. We'd been promised it was our land in perpetuity. If it was handed over to the blacks, one would have to leave, and your children would lose their heritage. Europeans, unable to accept the idea of black government, were already packing up to leave. To defuse white anxiety, the new governor risked a black explosion. I repeat and confirm that in my view, Jomo Kenyatta's release would be at present a danger to security. The decision is mine. By this statement, I wish to make it clear that accordingly, he will remain under restriction. His Excellency the Governor has called you an evil man who would lead to darkness and to death. What are you feeling from Well, that is lie. I think it's no, it, 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 there is no uh, grain of truth in that. Because my whole life, I have been trying to uplift my people to better ways of life. They wanted people, all the propaganda which they sent around, wanted the people to believe that Kenyatta is an evil uh, leader who had put the country into trouble and he should never be allowed to come back to life again. The governor's broadcast increased African pressure for Kenyatta's release. When the Kenya African National Union, KANU, won the election, its leaders refused office until Kenyatta was freed. The deadlock now threatened the peaceful transfer of power that Britain wanted. So, in August 1961, Governor Renison bowed to the inevitable. And at last, here comes Kenyatta, flown from detention in Maralao and driven on the last stage of his journey in a police vehicle. Did 
Immediately, he's surrounded by reporters and he gives an impromptu press conference on the steps of his new home. My first message to my people will be to thank them for what they have done for me and to ask them to keep calm. Uh, that is, not to make any trouble uh, in their rejoicing for my return. And um, uh, through there, we can build a united Kenya. Mr. Kenyatta, do you think you'll be able to form a political party uniting Kanu and Kadu? I do not recognize, uh, I mean, favor one of them. I say I belong to both of them. What are your political ideals, Mr. Kenyatta? What is your political philosophy? <laughs> My political philosophy. Well, I think my political philosophy is, well, if I can say, love thy neighbor as uh, thyself. <laughs> and, and who is your neighbor? Uh, I think the world is my neighbor. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Vervoort once described his policy as good neighborliness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that can be sorted out. If it's made possible for you to take a seat in LegCo, in the Parliament, would you do that? Here again, I cannot put myself in LegCo. That, I leave that to my people. If they elect me to sit in LegCo, I would gladly do so. Would you like to do that yeah. soon, if possible? As soon as my people want me to do it. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest problem facing Africa today? There's many big problems facing Africa today, uh, Africa today. That is, one, we must eliminate ignorance. Two, hunger, disease. And those are the, um, I mean, many other uh, problems, but I think those are the uh, most important. Kenya is a poor country, and its best future probably lies in the idea of an East African Federation with Uganda and Tanganyika and possibly Zanzibar. One measure of Kenyatta's success will be whether Kenya manages to achieve that. Good night. Lancaster House has staged many colonial conferences, but this was the first one with picturesque touches. Headdresses with lion's mane cloaks indicate the importance of the tribal leaders. The conference discussed the future of Kenya. Jomo Kenyatta, perhaps the outstanding African in his country, desires a central government. Mr Ngala, his chief opponent, prefers a federation of regions not dominated by the Kikuyu tribe. The present governor is Sir Patrick Renison. Colonial Secretary Reginald Maudling hopes for a constitution that will guarantee equality before an impartial law as well as freedom from fear and oppression. Gentlemen, this conference is of crucial importance to the future of Kenya. Upon the degree of our success or failure will depend the well-being, the livelihood, and perhaps even the physical safety of all the citizens of Kenya of whatever race or creed. This is the measure of the responsibility that now rests upon... Looking back today, I am glad to be able to say that Kano is proud of its contribution at this conference.
We are fully prepared to complete, to cooperate in the task ahead and invite all other parties and sections to work with us in this noble task. It is necessary that I state clearly at this juncture that Khan shall not tolerate any effort or maneuver to slow down Kenya's independence. Intertribal suspicions and fears are part of the hard facts of life in Kenya today. And uh, any constitution which may be devised and which is to stand any chance of success must take these hard facts into account. The problem is to reconcile administrative efficiency, that is to say, strong central government, with effective safeguards uh, against domination of one group of sides uh, by another. being chosen and admitted to the cabinet in Kenya, do swear that I will be true and faithful to Kenya and that I will, be, I, I will to the best of my judgment, freely give my counsel and advice for the good management of the public affairs of Kenya. I, Jomo Kenyatta, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II, her heir and successor according to law. So
After his release, Kenyatta accepted the presidency of Kanu, a party whose radical platform had included the seizure of European-owned land. The whites were horrified. Kanu was a near certainty to take over when Britain left. Kanu did give the impression of being excessively extreme. Uh, land confiscation, nationalization of all industry, closing down of foreign investment, excessive Africanization. So naturally, British interests were disturbed because they thought they would have an extreme, perhaps almost communist regime. Mr. Kenyatta, some of the 60,000 European settlers here are frightened that their titles to land and their right to stay in Kenya may be thrown overboard when a Kenyan administration takes over. Well, and I don't think they have anything to fear. For providing that they behave as a good citizen. Kenyatta surprised everyone, white and black. To secure independence, he knew that Kenya needed stability, not a new upheaval. He overruled the radicals. We don't want to rob uh, anybody of, uh, of his property. We're not concerned of robbing people of their property, no. Uh, but what we want to get is power, that is... Um, uh, the, 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 the government. We want to rule our country. Our means. How will you govern Kenya? Democratically. And what are, is the future for whites and Asians in Kenya? Well, they have uh, every um, hope, like any other uh, citizen in Kenya. They will be protected just as um, any other uh, citizen in Kenya is protected right to um, their own property. We have the deal of right to protect every citizen in this country. What, is, what will be your policy towards South Africa and the Portuguese territory? Well, South Africa, that is definite. We're going to follow the decision taken at uh, the uh, Addis Ababa uh, conference. What was that then? Well, uh, don't you know what it is? How will you fight South Africa? Fight South Africa? We're not interested in fighting, it's not, not only, uh, we do not mean we're going to fight South Africa in the way perhaps you think, but we have uh, other means rather than, rather than fighting with the arm and uh, ammunition. Coming back to Kenya, sir, uh, as President of Prime Minister, Kenyatta, can you give us some date for full independence? Well, we want um, the uh, full independence this year. As far as the date is uh, concerned, I can't tell you just uh, what the date is, but we want the uh, independence this year. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Kenyatta was afraid that many of his supporters would grab white-owned land. He needed to buy it for them. He turned to Britain for the money and distributed some land in the White Highlands to African farmers. Kenyatta, with British aid, fought off Kikuyu unrest. He had no place for Mau Mau. He ordered the few fighters left in the forest to come out. Kenyatta gave them nothing, but greeted them as heroes. He's going to be an ordinary citizen, because all he wanted to see is an African flag flying over Kenya. That's all he was important. What, what are his followers going to do with their arms? Uh, their follower <laughs> and their arm will Kenya. bring they will bring their arms to me, to their government. The settlers were still wary. They invited him to a meeting in the Highlands. Honourable ministers, your worships, are addressing a large farming audience. The agricultural, his views about the agricultural uh, of, the, of the future. And on our side, it gives us the opportunity, through the medium of questions, to find about the various subjects that are causing us considerable worry and alarm at the present moment. Now, everyone in this hall here today, and I know the Prime Minister of the Practical Farmer will agree with me, realizes that uh, farming is not a short-term operation unless one can see one's future well ahead for a period of years we shall never make the best of our agricultural land which after all it, on which the whole economy of our country depends 
not for a considerable length of time, probably a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, after which he will answer questions. Now, the Board of Agriculture... Uh, Mr. Chairman, Your Worship, ladies and gentlemen, it is great pleasure for me to be here this afternoon to address such a large gathering of farmers like myself. I think we have something in common. I am a politician, but in the first place, I am a farmer like you. So I think in our talk, we'll find something in common. Because I think the soil join us all, and um, therefore we have a kind of mutual understanding. Why I say I'm very uh, happy to be here is because I do know, and I believe in this, that if you want to understand one another, the best thing is to talk together, to exchange views. You cannot understand one another. You cannot believe in one another unless you have an opportunity of talking to one another. And this is why I say I am very glad to be here. I believe that the most dangerous things or the most disturbing uh, point among us is suspicion, fear. These are created by not knowing what other the section is thinking. If it's an African, maybe he is suspicious of an African farmer because he does not know of what he is aiming at. Or if it's European, he is perhaps afraid of an African that, oh, why, I don't know what is in his, uh, um, under his sleeves and all that kind of thing. And that's why I say, if we must live together, if we must work together, we must talk together. We must exchange views. This is my belief. And one another thing which I want to uh, <coughs> make clear is this, that we must also learn how to forgive one another. We, there's no society of angel everywhere. I don't think so. Not in any community whether it be white, brown, or black. We are not angels, we are human beings. And as such, we are bound to make mistakes. But we have a great gift which we can exercise, and that is to forgive one another. If I have done mistake to you, it's for you to forgive me. If you have done to me, I say it's for me to forgive you. Now, I think it was the British Prime Minister, Mr. Macmillan, who told us some time ago that we must adopt ourselves in the wind of change. Nobody knew at that time what, uh, what or how that wind of change would blow towards our shores here. It has come. The wind of change is here with us. Are we going to accept it? Are we going to change, to fit in, to fit ourselves in changing conditions? This is a great question for us today. For us to adapt ourselves to new situations. If we could do so, Mr. Chairman, I think we will be able to eliminate one of um, the most difficulty among ourselves. That is, to know that this is not 1900, this is 1963. And if we can adapt ourselves to that, then I think we will be able to work together. And I believe, with a good will, you be a settler, I be uh, an African farmer. What do I want to get out of the, out of the land? I want to get my livelihood. 
I want to see that my children are well fed. I want to see that my children are well educated. I want to see that my children are well housed, well clothed. They are in good health, that they are well looked after. I, I want to assure you here as Prime Minister of Kenya that we need your experience in field of agriculture, in field of business, in field of employment, that is in civil service. We need your experience. But we want you to cooperate with us. Those of you who have had selfish motives, please forget it. Be a human being. And I'm asking my African follower to do the same, to be human beings, so that we can work together to make Kenya a suitable place for human beings to live in. Some of you have been alarmed by stock theft. The thieves in campaign. There has been blood boiling. We are going to win. We are going to down with this, down with us. And young blood has been boiling all along for these few months which we've been carrying out the electioneering campaign. Like any other youth in any other country, this bubbling has to come out, has to cool down, and we are trying what we can to cool it down. This too, I tell you, we are. Hey! is great and all of us and I'm not telling you this because I'm in your meeting I'm telling you what I believe and what my government believes that white brown black can work together harmoniously in this country and make this country great we can <coughs> we can show other people in various parts of the world that different racial groups can work together harmoniously. Kenyatta said, if I made mistakes, forgive me. If you made mistakes, I forgive you. We must not forget the past, but we must forgive and work together. <laughs> to think, Herr God, we have a statesman who does not want to take our land away, who does not want to kick us all out, who wants to keep the European farming here, who wants to keep the European community. And it did more to reassure the expatriate community than any other speech made by any other leader in this country. Malcolm McDonald, Jomo Kenyatta, and Ronald Ngala were at Nairobi Airport to welcome Mr. and Mrs. Duncan Sands. The Colonial Secretary is to meet the top men out there in a constitutional conference. King's African Rifles mounted the Guard of Honor. Kenyatta and Ngala are Governor McDonald's Ministers of State. Their goal is self-government for Kenya with complete independence as soon as possible. Government Road, Nairobi, the main thoroughfare, reflects the prosperity of the country. A 
splendid legacy for the new government that will take over when the constitution has been hammered out. Mr. Sands will give on-the-spot help to Kenyatta to come to terms with Africans who don't see eye to eye with him. Mr. MacDonald is giving invaluable help. Now, Shindy! I appeal to all of you, white, brown, black, as the citizens of Kenya, to unite and work harmoniously for the progress of our country. I wish to tell you that without this cooperation, without this working together, we cannot benefit our country. We cannot make progress in any direction unless we work as one team. We must learn to forgive one another. We must adopt the method of give and take. Cause for the struggle was to gain our land back and independence or self-government was only being used as a means of taking back our land. And without, without land, then everybody thought that we had been sold out. Have you found that since independence things have gone as badly as you expected or better than you expected? Oh, they've gone better than I expected. On the whole, since independence, have things gone better or worse than you expected? Oh, far better. They've gone infinitely better than I thought they would. And who do you give the credit for that to? To Jomo Kenyatta and his government. They've been an extremely stable government. When all of the detainees had come home from the camps and the remnants of the Land Freedom Army emerged from the forests, they found themselves in a world they'd helped to make, but in which they had little part. I regret to state that those of us who fought for freedom were never given a chance to participate in the present government. The majority of ex-freedom fighters are among those who live here in these shanties because they have nowhere else to go. We weren't given jobs because it was alleged we were uneducated. The young who were in school during the freedom struggle are the ones who have the say in our government and they are not concerned with our affairs. But we still say that our government is good because Mze Kenyatta is there. But if he were not there, we would say that justice has not been done to those of us who fought for freedom. It is not Mze Kenyatta's fault. It is the fault of these young men who joined the government and undertook its leadership. The garden party at Government House was an informal farewell to British rule in Kenya. Jomo Kenyatta presented some of the guests to the Duke and Mr. Sands. An epoch of 68 years was closing, years in which a wilderness became a thriving country. At Nairobi, the Duke of Edinburgh and Mr. Kenyatta received the freedom of the city. At the Uhuru Stadium, the Articles of Independence were handed by the Duke to the country's Prime Minister. At midnight, the Union Jack was lowered for the last time, and Kenya ceased to be a colony and became independent. She remains in the Commonwealth.
It was estimated that a quarter million people witnessed the moving ceremony. Then it was as though someone had said, let joy be unconfined. Uninhibited tribal dancing took over. No one can say that Africans make the mistake of taking their pleasure sadly. Good luck to Kenya in her new role as an independent nation.